It is unit one introduction to management system. I dropped in the chat box so that the chat box so that everyone will know what we are doing now. So it is basically with respect to the in, uh, system that is the management systems. Now here uh, in the page eight last paragraph now that's what we are covering. Now ISO 9000 2000 standards apply to all kinds of organization that we have already seen. Various uh, examples are given there, like you know, legal services, financial services. So various examples are given there. You know, even pest control, education, consumer products, transportation. All those examples are given, like various kinds of industries or areas where these management systems can be implemented. Now let's go into the um, 9000 actually is dealt in another portion in detail, the next unit, the coming units, it will be uh, done in detail. That's why they are going moving on to ISO 14001. ISO 14001 is basically environment management system. Okay, now we are in page nine, page nine of unit one, page nine of unit one. Okay, where the introduction to 14,000. Now, what is this 14,001, 2004? 14,000, you would have seen, uh, you know, people putting up boards where they write that this is this, the company is also certified as per so and so, like ISO 14,000. Basically, ISO 14,000 is for the environmental system. Now, what is the environmental system? Manage the system for the environment. Environment is basically, as the name says, it is a set of uh, systems which has got to do with how the organization protects or contributes to the protection of the environment. Protection of environment basically would mean what? Are you creating any pollution? Is there any discharge from your organization or what is the system that you are um, uh, using to prevent it? How do you prevent it? And, uh, and what is your role? Like some, some factories, they do certain uh, reprocessing. They have certain kinds of scrubbers. They introduce, they have, uh, you know, what is it called? Waste treatment plants and all that. How, why? It is to prevent the pollution. You cannot, there are so many requirements of legal requirements. So 14,000 standard actually deals with the environment management standard. Basically, this, as the word itself says, it is to do with the uh, st management standard, management standard, which governs or which supports the organization or governs the uh, organization's policies on what is the, what, how is it protecting the environment. So it again, it varies with different uh, organization. The requirements and the policies of an organization will differ, but this applies to all type of organization. Again, as we saw in 9,000, here also, in 14,000 also, this is applicable to all the uh, various organizations, irrespective of the size and what they are doing. Irrespective of the size and what they, uh, what they are engaged with. Now, how do you use ISO 14001? Like if an organization, they do not have an environment system, how do you do it? You there. You have to take the standard first, and uh, what you need to do is you have to. The aim, what is the aim? The aim is to protect the environment. Okay, so that is the aim, and every organization would have defined the requirements. You would have defined how to control already, and then then you go into the system and see what more needs to be done. So first thing is. You can demonstrate that your organization's commitment, how you will do it. You can simply announce that, yes, I'm compliant with 14,001. But is 
simple announcement that I'm complying with 14,000 uh, is enough? No, you can, you have to always check it out. You have to check it out along with the standard, whether that requirement is also met or not. You can ask your customers or other interested parties to confirm that EMS complies with the ISO. You know, you can ask your customers or other interested parties that they can get it confirmed whether you are meeting or not. You can ask an 14,000 registrar or an external auditor to verify. That is why these ISO systems, there is a network of uh, certifying bodies in all the countries who, if you approach them saying that, I want my uh, organization to be certified as per ISO 14001, they'll come to your organization, they will do a checking of your system, what you have implemented in place, and they will um, check if it complies with the requirements. Now, to meet the requirements, there are certain uh, factors on which it depends. One is the size of your organization. See, uh, it can be applied to all, definitely, but the requirements will be different because the requirements of every factory, the policies of every factory will differ. So the size of the organization, if it is uh, you know, the number of people will differ, the location of your organization again will differ, whether it is next to a water body or it is very near, nearly close to a, you know, um, uh, I mean, a, to, a, to a water body and then uh, the location, whether it is very near the city uh, and it is in the heart of the city or because, the, for example, if it's a production unit, what kind of gases are being evolved, all these things matter. The scope of your organization's EMS. EMS is a short form for environment management system. That is why EMS is being used in several places instead of ISO 14001. The content of your environmental policy, that is the organization will have their own environmental policy. So what is contained in your environmental policy, the nature of your activities, products and services, the environmental impact of your environmental aspects, the legal and other requirements that must be met. See, it sounds last, but it is not the least. That is actually a very important thing. What is it? The legal and other requirements. See, that there are legal requirements of every country. Like when it comes to environment, I don't have to mention that the legal requirement comes from Pollution Control Board. The Pollution Control board, board has got its own sets of requirements that any, uh, you know, if it is a slaughterhouse, it is a you know, food manufacturing um, organization, or if it's a, in a hospital, all will have their, their, it has got a set of legal requirements which you need to set up before you start running the organization. Depending upon what will be the discharge, is there any uh, base product which is um, uh, coming as a byproduct of your uh, whatever you produce, or is it harmful? Is it radioactive? Or it is uh, is it toxic? All these things are there. So those have got already the legal requirements are there, which you need to uh, adhere to to comply with to run the organization. This is on top of the legal requirements which are there for the environment and other requirements. First thing is identify your environment review. How do you review it? Identify your organization's environmental aspects, which means you have to study the normal and abnormal operating conditions, as well as accidents, disasters, and emergency situations. Identify the Identify the uh, environmental aspects and associate it with all operating conditions and situations. Then clarify the legal and other requirements that apply to your organization's environmental aspects. 
Examine your organization's current environment management policies, procedures, and practices. You may be having already certain environment management policies, like whatever. Supposing it's a food uh, manufacturing unit, you may have a lot of washing water. Supposing it is a seafood uh, factory, where what happens is these shrimp or the various kinds of fishes when they are brought in, it is washed. It is washed, and then that is a that water which in which you have wash, washed the fish. That is the base water. That is the base water. Now, if it just you just uh, allow it to flow it into your drainage system, and then to the main city municipal drainage system, it may be it may not be very harmful if there is no toxic things involved. But at the same time. when it comes to uh, say say textile uh, manufacturing unit in a textile manufacturing unit a big issue is the waste of the dyes various kinds of colors are being used to color the fabric and it is all in a solution form now after coloring the textile that is the fabric the remaining ones is a problem if you just let it go into the drainage system so you have to introduce you have to make a treatment of what your wastage is generated and then the wastage that waste water has to be subjected to various kinds of treatment before you let the let it uh, go to your uh, municipal drainage so that it is not harmful so that is already existing your organization environment policies needs to be um you know um uh, reviewed and then your scope of ems when iso 14000 must ask you to define your scope it is asking you to define its boundary now whether the ems you are applying for the entire organization or to a specific operating unit or facility that you have to be very uh you know define first before going for the certification for 14000 now if you are have already having an ems and you have to just update it then you need to do a gap analysis okay we have to do a gap analysis what is a gap analysis gap analysis is first you review the requirement and then you check it along with the con existing condition of your environment policies procedures and the aspects which you have set up and when you compare these two you will know that this 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 point we are not meeting the requirements of the standard you note it down and then you try to cover it up you address it and then you fill it up that is called filling up of the gaps and that's how you move on to uh, set up your Uh, in non management system now what is the structure and interpretation see the structure now the in the introduction i'll tell you in which page we are it is page number 11 page number 11 of unit 1 okay then structure and interpretation of 14000 in most of the management system whether the system says or doesn't say one methodology is pdca what is pdca pdca is a short form for plan do check and act plan is if you take a very simple example of say building a house what do we do first we get a plan for how we are going to build a house and then you uh, you have to start doing it start implementing it that is but that comes in do once you do it start doing it you keep checking whether this was my plan is, am i doing it correctly whatever the size of the rooms are being planned is it being done correctly that is what you check and then finally act what why does that act come in the last term because by checking you have seen that okay this is not perfect this was not the size of the room that i had asked for then you tell the contractor or the mason saying that this is not what i wanted so you take an action you say okay please demolish this part and please redo it okay because it is not as per the plan that 
four steps is called planning, doing, checking, and acting. PDCA. So that methodology is followed in setting up all the management system, not only this one, all the management system, this is the uh, PTCA will be the methodology followed. Scope is basically you define the requirements and applicability criteria and then the references which are, you know, which you have to take because you need to refer to so many things when you are going for a, a particular management system. Terms and definitions, there are around 20 key terms that are being defined in the standard and I'm not going to you know, go through each one, you can read it and you can understand that very easily. So I'm going to the next one which is environment management system requirements. Now under the clause 4, the management system requirements, they start listing up the management system requirements. Clause 4.1 is a general requirement establishing, documenting, implementing, maintaining, and improving an environment system is stated under 4.1 general requirement. That is the environmental policy, where environmental policy, again, requirement, what is it defined? Defined within the defined scope of its environment management system. It started the scope, it is stated about the contents, commitment to the legal requirements stated and how will you continually improve it is stated. That is a policy. That is a policy of the organization. Okay. And then comes the planning. 4.3 is the planning, which is the environment aspects, legal and other requirements. In this, this legal and other requirement, it is mandatory. It will be met by all the organizations which are doing going for a management system requirement because this legal part is already always in place. And then comes the objectives, targets and programs. Now you have set a, a certain objectives which is to be met. So how you are going to meet it, whether it is meeting the requirements or not, whatever objectives and targets you have set up. Implementation and then finally the operation. Resources, roles, responsibilities and authority. Now when you go for a establishment of any kind of ISO system, there always will be a resources, roles, responsibilities and authority. Like who will be providing the resource it is well defined who is the resource person and what all kind of resources will be required. That is a part of the review done. Roles and responsibility. Roles and responsibility can be very simple to complicated ones. But still, whatever, whose role or what role is being done by each and every member who is involved in the system is defined. Competence, training and awareness. Now, all these requirements comes with a specific competence and the training and awareness programs are required. That is defined in 4.4.2. Communication. What is communication? Communication not only uh, between the organization and the external uh, body, but also communication within the organization system. Okay, within the organization and among the um, organization that does not mean that if I have to communicate something to my colleague who is sitting next to me I will have to need a document no it's not like that it is that supposing there is an order or a requirement from a higher up which has to go to the lowest level of the uh, person in the organization then you know some kind of putting up the notice in the notice board you put the date this is this has been informed to so and so and this is what has to be followed. That is the kind of communication that the system is asking for. Documentation, of course, everything needs to be documented. It has to be a documented procedure for every simple work. There has to be a documented procedure. Control of documents, control of documents will we will come across in every standard every standard talks about that whatever document is there you need to control it control doesn't mean that you have to keep the documents under lock and key no control means 
that any document who has prepared it and what is the uh, rightness of the information in it. The information which is contained in the document should be true and it should be correct. Somebody has to approve it. So you have to, in roles and responsibilities, it is defined who will be preparing the document, who will be writing it down, the policies, who will be approving it. And after approval, there will be a certain ID given to the document and then it is circulated among the among all the um, uh, members of the organization. Now, operation control. Operation control is basically uh, about the various um, uh, procedures which is operated and how it is checked, whether it is correct or not, if there is any non-conformance, it is raised, it is addressed. Emergency preparedness and response, as the name itself says, it is uh, it's a, this procedure for identifying, reviewing and responding to emergency situations. Now, next is checking. What all kinds of checks do you implement? Monitoring and measurement. Monitoring and measurement is one of the checking. You have to monitor. Supposing you have set a procedure saying that, okay, the, uh, you know, the place where the product is kept will be chilled or will be air conditioned. The temperature will be maintained as 25 degrees. So whether the, it is done or not. So how do you know? You have to monitor it. Evaluation of compliance, you have to evaluate and see if it is meeting all the legal requirements or not. Non-conformity, corrective and preventive action. If it does not meet a requirement, then it is called non-conformity. It is not conforming. That also is documented. And once any non-conformity is raised, a corrective action is taken. And to help this non-conformity not to be present not to come across you have to put some preventive actions in place control of records all these activities when you are doing it will generate some kind of records so for that the whatever records are being generated it has to have a particular index it has to be stored in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a manner in which it can be easily retrieved when it is required. You can pull it out from the files. It has to be numbered. It has to, it has to have an indication of who has done it. Okay, every record. That is why record without a signature is of least importance because the signature only says that who has performed it, the person who has performed it. Now, internal audit, after establishing all these things, internal audit is done for what? So that you know that all these implemented, your in-house procedures, your own policies are being followed. It can have a, you know, a regular schedule for it. It can be twice a year, thrice a year, or maybe once in two years. It all depends upon the policy of the uh, organization. Now, what do you mean by management review? After all that, there is a management review. See, you put certain systems in place and if there is nobody to turn around and look into it or how it is acting, then all the implementation, everything, it just goes down the drain because people may not follow and the management will not know what is happening. So that is the reason why a review is put in place. Management has to review at least once in a year or any plan intervals. It can be uh, once in six months. It can be once in two years. Whatever, as per the policy of an organization, where the heads of the uh, organization, they sit, they listen to the, uh, you know, the sectional divisions, each section division, and a detailed discussion of what is the status and what has to be done for the future, what has to be in what has to be done for the improvement of the organization or wherever the non-conformities have been observed, uh, observed what was the non-conformity, what is the corrective action to be taken and how they are going to deal with it. That is the management review. That is all about 14,000. So in brief, 
if you have to write a small brief about the 14001 uh, management system you have to you can now say that after we have covered this you can say that it is all about setting up the environment policies and how you uh, how you protect the environment and what are the procedures and everything put in place and for the system to be working and the methodology adopted will be pdca pdca methodology is adopted not only for this management system it is adopted for you can say universally for any system the same methodology is adopted where p stands for planning d stands for doing um c stands for uh, checking and a stands for acting on it acting on what acting on the findings okay so we can go to the next one in your unit uh, in your material study material next one is oceus 18001 what is oceus 18001 and how we deal with it it is in page number 14 page number 14 of unit 1 it is introduction to uh, oceus 18001 now what is the full form of oceus when we say oceus o h s a s it is occupational health safety management system okay it ideally it should have come s m s i would say s m s would have been a better short form but the short form is oceus that is s a s but it stands for occupational health safety management system occupational health it's very simple everyone can understand what do we mean by occupational health and safety management it is got to do with the safety of the people around who is working and many organizations have put this in place oceus 18001 it's very very important and they have put this 18001 2007 is a revised version okay it's a revised version it had uh, previously it was uh, 18001 1999 and then the that one was uh, re reviewed and revised and the new version was introduced which was 18001 in 2007 now what does it do actually now what is the purpose of oceus purpose of oceus is to help organizations to manage and control their occupational health and safety risk what is occupational health occupational health is the health of the people with respect to the occupation isn't it and to improve their ohns performance they can achieve this purpose by developing an ohsms that complies with ohsas 18001 so the standard is abbreviated as ohsas by the talking about the management system they refer to as ohsms okay and oh sms is a network of interrelated elements what are the interrelated elements these include the responsibilities the authorities the relationship the functions activities processes practices procedures and resources okay these elements are used to establish occupational health and safety policies it can plan program and then achieve the objectives which they have set and um, the concept of ohsms is rather abstract however fortunately we don't really have to completely grasp absorb and memorize what it means fine we don't have to memorize is what they say yeah now what is this about how you implement it what how uh, what is it the features of this standard is what we will look into if you don't have a osha's system in place how you can 
implement this is what it is uh, given in the next page that is uh, page number 9 i think sorry page number 15 in page number 15 of your material you will see it has listed and how does it differ from organization to organization because it depends upon what factors this is about the health and safety so obviously health and safety will differ upon the activity of the organization it will definitely depend upon the size of the organization again the location of the organization the nature of the organization's culture the nature of organization's activities the legal obligations scope of your organization content of your organization's policy nature of your organization's hazards and nature of your organization's risk now it says so many places about the hazard the risk as well as the policies now uh, as uh, everyone knows about this legal ob obligations are there with respect to um, your occupational health and safety policies again if we take an example of say a fertilizer factory a fertilizer factory will be producing so many various kinds of chemicals and uh, fertilizers if they do not have a particular uh, this health and safety policy it can be so dangerous for a person who is working there in the factory why because that person is going to be exposed to all this a person who is working in the factory in the packaging division may be exposed more than a manager who is sitting in a in the cabin inside the cabin and who is looking into the accounts of that structure that is why it says your cultures your activities it depends so it depending upon the activity the structure of the organization and all you have to uh, document the your osha's uh, management system it is used for certification purposes it is designed and is used for certification purpose but it does not require a um, mandatory certification these standards are not mandatory but there are legal obligations which are mandatory for an organization where it says that you have to comply with it okay that that there is no choice so if your you can do a self assessment that is a self audit based on your uh, standard that is osha 18001 standard and can self certify that is you can do a self certification of osha 18001 and we are meeting the requirements of osha 18001 and you can do a self certification again the same pdca methodology is also working here what we saw no plan to check and act the same pdca methodology what we have just gone through uh, in the 14001 the same methodology is adopted here now you will come across when you we, we are going to uh, see this um, uh, you know uh, other systems other systems how we do it this methodology i would like to uh, again stress on it that it will be common this plan do check and act methodology is always common okay now it says now when you are doing a pdca approach plan what are you planning you have to plan about your management system how to implement it who will do it what will be done how to document it all that comes in planning what are you going to do once you plan it you have to establish your management system how do you check it you have to evaluate it now what you have planned is it coming according to that or not what do you act you improve your management system how do you act you are acting on the gaps when you are um, seeing that 
whether it is according to your um, requirements, according to the plans or the documented procedures, whether it is being carried out or not, you have to act and put things in place when you see that it is not as per the plan. Only then any management system can be uh, you know, established properly and can be maintained. You can achieve your objectives only when you act upon it and when you uh, check it as per the documented procedures. Now that will be your, um, that PDCA methodology will be the methodology in which you do, do all the uh, work. Now this PDCA methodology, in general approach, just if it is to be said, PDCA is just four terms. Now, how do you actually do it when you want to establish it? Then if there is a list of uh, activities is given. Around uh, 33 activities has been listed out. If you look into page 16, you can see a list of activities has been given like defining the scope of your uh, management system, then your organization's policy. Okay, like that, uh, various uh, steps are given, 33 steps are given, but all these are finally to, with, uh, to do with your, um, what is it called, your management system for occupational health and safety. So that's about the uh, OSHAs. And next is, 27,000. ISO IEC 27,001. It is upon the information technology, which is the buzzword of the present times, information technology and the security techniques. I think every one of us, now we are, we are forced to use the information technology, the technology where a lot of security is required. Right? We are all using this online um, transfer of money. We are using online so many things. Online transfer of technology, online education. If you just see after specifically after this uh, COVID pandemic times have begun, we understand the importance of this information technology that is IT. They have just uh, played a tremendous role in you know, bringing the life to normalcy. People have started working from home. All this has taken place because IT is there in place. Now, so obviously with IT or with this information technology in place, we can very well understand that it definitely requires a management system for what? For the security information security management system basically it is also called as ISMS which is information security management system now um, if not we take examples of complicated activities if we take a very simple um, example of say uh, taking online classes itself it generates a code, a specific code is generated so that, you know, and it is given to the mail of the specific person who is going to attend and only that person can join through that particular link. So is it not basically a security that you are setting up so that you have a check of, you know, general public joining to, the, uh, to a lecture or to a meeting? Yes, it is. Similarly, that is the simplest thing, which is not very complicated. But if you uh, look into like your online transfer of money, your bank accounts are linked, you do so many, uh, we do so many online transactions or online transactions of money is involved in so many banking activities, all these. So, According to the activity which is done, according to the business which is done, since according to the risk which is involved, the security features also will be more and more. 
the security feature for an online class by a school will be very less compared to and it will definitely be more when it compares to the uh, security features of a paid uh, course if you are paying for a course like your course you are paying money and then you are doing this course you have uh, the, the organization has certain policies to see to it that there is the um, classes which are conducted online it has got to have certain security uh, features similarly when you come to banking when it involves paying making payments like your your google pay or your paytm or whatever we are using again it requires certain uh, security management system so all this are uh, under this 27001 okay so it uh, meeting um, how how we meet each of this 27001 requirements and to what extent depends upon some factors which is size and structure the needs and objectives of a, a of a uh, organization the security requirements just as i gave the examples of uh, qq services and then the business processes what business process are you involved in so this deals with uh, again if you come to the methodology which is adopted same bbca model is there where the section 4 will uh, will uh, be explaining in detail about the establishment of the uh, isms section 5 expects to implement operate and maintain your isms the under section 6 and 7 it gives about the uh, how to monitor measure audit and review and finally a section gives the corrective and preventive actions if that is only to improve your system now a list of uh, procedures a list of steps or activities like any other management system here also file sms also it is given what should be put in place so that you implement your system and then how you implement it and after implementation how you audit it review and when you find a gap Uh, when you compare with your system and the requirements of the iso system then you fill that gap using the corrective action you put things in place whatever is missing and then you fill up the gap because only then the system will improve improve and then only you can call that the complete system is implemented here also the same pdca model is applied so that is the end of unit 1 few definitions all that are given in your uh, study material and uh, more important there is few suggested reading given suggested reading is given for certain iso uh, management systems which is given at the end of the unit with that we end the unit 1 unit number 2 which is on auditing unit 2 is regarding auditing and uh, uh, now in the pdca methodology which we have already done in the introduction we have seen that almost all the management systems are set up, set up with the methodology of pdca pdca is basically what plan do check and act in that methodology the check that is the c p d c a the c of the methodology is the checking basically checking is what we call auditing okay now checking is basically auditing and how you audit it sounds that auditing process i am sure all of you are very familiar with the term audit because uh, you would have seen this if not in your organization where you are working at least you would have seen or heard about this always in uh, you know the financial uh, terms where the accounts revisions they are audited they are audited for the expenditures the you know the income 
and uh, also in various government levels also you would have heard that uh, audit is going on and let's wait and see what the outcome is so it is basically audit is a checking of the process process of what what you have set up what are the requirements of your system that is audit now there is a specific uh, iso system there is a specific iso system which deals with the activity of auditing that auditing is given in iso 19011 which was established in the year 2002 okay it is established in the year uh, 2002 and a specific iso system for auditing now let's go through this unit and understand what is the requirement of requirements of auditing auditing covers so many aspects basically we have seen auditing is what auditing is checking of the system what we are we have implemented so it has a, a way, uh, it is a bundle of guidelines basically a bundle of guidelines which uh, is put down for auditing and also environment management system and the quality system okay environment management system can also be audited using the same so it is a bundle of guidelines how to do an audit Now, what does it uh, um, include? And it can be the reason of audit can be various. It can be certification. It can be internal review. It can be part contract compliance, etc. What is the basic uh, requirement? The quality and uh, and the system and the environmental audits. First thing, a clear explanation of the principles of managing system auditing is defined there. competence and evaluation of auditors it's not that anybody can audit or it's not that all tom dick and harry can do an audit no you have to be competent to do an audit then the management of the audit programs how do you set up how do you make the schedule how you carry it out is the audit program and then on a guidance it's also includes the internal as well as external audit now what do you mean by internal audit and what do you mean by an external audit uh, that may not be given in your material i just tell you one thing what an inter internal audit is done by a person who is within the organization okay it, it is within the organization and it is done for the improvement of the organization when you audit your own system your own set of procedure your own management system what is the end product of the audit that you do you have you have set found certain non compliances which needs to be addressed so that when you address those your system gets improved otherwise there is no point in setting up any kind of system and if it has got full of gaps and then you you claim that your management system is clean there is no point in putting such a system in place that is the reason why we do an internal audit and check it up what is external audit external audit auditors auditing an a different organization where you are not working where you are independent free of the organization that is called a third party organization you are being audited by a third party who is not involved in your work okay so this guidance it has got internal audit as well as external audit now this internal international standard is very flexible why why is it flexible the reason is because the organization which needs to be audited varies in size it can vary in nature it can vary in the complexity of the uh, work it does and also the objectives the scopes 
and the policy of an organization. That is the reason why the standard is also very flexible to cover all this, to involve all these. The uh, uh, standard also is given in a flexible manner. Now, how does it do? Not all are covered in this ISO. It describes the principles of auditing. Class 5 describes the guidance of managing the audit program. Then it gives the guidance on conducting the audit, how you actually do it, that is conducting the audit. Then guidance on the competence needed by an auditor. That is also very, very important, the competence of an auditor. Now we go to by class by class. If you go, I'll go with the page number 29 of your material. You will see class 1, class 2, class 3, like that. 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. So, and then looking into the class 1, that is the scope of the standard. What is the scope of the standard? It is applicable to all organization needing to conduct internal or external audits. Any organization which requires internal or external uh, auditing is covered by this particular standard. The references are given. What are the references taken? We did, uh, I did say in the introduction that ISO 9000 is what? Fundamentals and vocabulary, right? In unit one, in the introduction, we said that, okay, what is a bunch of ISO 9000? One of the ISO 9000, which is 2000, has got fundamentals and vocabulary. Can you recollect? All of you, if you were there in the beginning of the class, we said that what is the importance of vocabulary? Why is a vocabulary given? Why are the terms defined? So ISO 9000, 2000, uh, 2000 has got a bundle of vocabulary where it explains each of the term that is used. Fine. And also, next reference is what? 14,050. Regarding environmental management vocabulary. We saw 14,000 is regarding what? Environment management system. The vocabulary is given in 14,050. Then the terms and definitions. What is an audit? You will see that note 1, note 2, note 3, note 4 is given. That is in page number 30, 30. Unit 2, 30. Now we'll go to clause 4, principles of auditing. How an audit should be done? What are the basic principles of audit that has to be followed? We have to follow certain principles in order to do the audit properly. Okay, so what are the principles? The principles relate to whom? Basically the auditors who are going to do it. Isn't it? The principle of the audit thing will be what? Basically to do with the auditors who are doing. So how should it be done? First point is ethical conduct. What is ethical conduct? All of you know what is ethics, right? What is ethics? Can anybody drop in the chat box? Because it will be very boring if you don't uh, drop even a single line. I see Ramesh Sri saying yes ma'am that uh, so it also gives me, uh, you know, uh, that, okay, there is somebody who is listening to me. Otherwise, it seems that I'm just making this talking and talking and talking. There's nobody to listen. Can anybody say, what is ethics? Just in one word, can you say what ethics means? In your own language, you can put. You have to use English language to express that song. What is ethics? This word is very important when it comes to auditing. Principles? Yeah, it, it is basically the principles. Principles of what? Principles of trust. Okay? Principles of trust and integrity. Fine? Integrity. 
integrity uh, ethics is doing a fair job okay that is ethics so ethical conduct is the first point the foundation of professionalism is basically ethics you need to stick on to the ethics that is trust should be there fair presentation that is that to represent the report the audit report truthfully and accurately that is the fair presentation audit findings audit conclusion audit reports should reflect truthfully it should be true to the findings okay and then due professional care has to be taken what is a professional what is being professional being professional is not being uh, you know petty you know, you don't listen to somebody or you get involved with the uh, people's opinions that is not a professional attitude you have to be professional and then independence what is independence independence is basically not showing any inclination towards any activity that is why the auditors who are selected for doing an audit should be free from the work that they are being audited they are going to audit supposing i am going to audit a production section of a food uh, factory say a factory which is uh, making um, uh, potato chips and the in charge of a particular packaging division i am myself doing the audit of that packaging division there that independency is not there so independent will happen when the auditor is independent of the activity that is being audited why because if i do the audit of my job i am definitely going to be biased what do you mean by bias bias means i will i will not see if there is anything wrong i will have a tendency to feel that whatever is being done is correct because i am the person who is doing it so that auditing auditing should be always done by a person who is independent then it should be evidence based approach it cannot be based on what an auditor thinks or feels is correct no it has to have an evidence what is the evidence evidence will be the records that are being available and based on the evidence an audit should be done now the clause 5 of uh, you can go to page number 31 you will see clause 5 managing an audit program how do we manage first thing the objectives of an uh, audit program needs to be presented how do you plan it management priorities commercial intentions why are we doing this audit that is has to be uh, recorded management system requirements then the statutory regulatory and contractual requirement that is to be understood basically what are the objectives the need for supplier evaluation and they have listed some more risk to the organization and all that extent of an audit program we need to know the audit to be done for the entire organization or any particular part of it uh, the frequency in which the audit has to be conducted the need for accreditation or registration or certification whatever is the requirement so what all needs to be covered in an audit program if a particular audit has to be run then the audit program responsibilities resources and procedures audit program responsibility will be with a particular we had seen that the roles and responsibilities are defined isn't it when we set up a management system the roles and responsibilities are defined so under that roles and responsibility it will be defined who is going to do the audit or are we going to get an external auditor whether it is going to be an internal audit or an external audit now as i said in a pdca methodology where does all this audit come it comes in the check that is the c c stands for check and it comes in check audit program resources when identifying resources for the audit program consideration should be given to what audit techniques processes 
now everything nothing comes free of cost right so the audit also can involve certain requirement of resource and that resource that also has to be identified who will provide whether it is an external when it is an external audit program the whether the organization provides when it is an external you know the legal requirements and all whether that organization will be providing whatever it is it needs to be defined Then we go to audit program implementation. Now you have a plan. You have selected auditors. You have also looked into the financial requirements, and you have set up certain audit program procedures. Now, actual audit program implementation. How do you implement it? You communicate the audit program to the relevant parties. Supposing if it is an external uh, audit, you communicate it. and then the process of evaluation of auditors and all those things also will be done okay the uh, audit team is selected then the necessary resources for the audit teams is uh, worked out all this is a part of implementation of the audit program then the audit program records what are the audit program records basically it is the audit plan and the audit report okay the plan and the report now audit report will have what all will it have only the summary of the audit no any piece of paper which is generated during the audit that is you know how the section was working this was the finding this was the requirement of the standard but while organization was having this that is the finding of a audit okay for example if we take a uh, example of a laboratory if you ask me what is the finding of a uh, of an audit an auditor comes he looks into your say sample receiving area now the laboratory is accepting milk sample okay with the milk sample there is a requirement that the milk sample should be chilled there has to be a provision to keep it as chilled the temperature has to be maintained so in the sample receiving area itself there has to a pro has to have a provision where the milk sample is kept in chill condition till it is given to the laboratory and also in the laboratory in the testing area also the provision to chill the product or to store the product in a chilled condition should be available so when an auditor comes he sees that there is no provision to chill the material that is a non conformity okay that non conformity is written down in the report and handed over to the organization now what is the corrective action corrective action is to provide a chilling system and then follow it up with reports if required like if the uh, chilling system has been provided and then what then it is just lying there no you have to go back you have to check whether it is being put in place within the time agreed time and it is being used and it is being useful and used in a required manner you have procured the refrigerator to store the sample but it is not being used it is just lying in one corner why because the electricity will be used up no that is not acceptable that is not acceptable so what has to be done you have to go back you have to understand that it is it is require requirement is whatever has been pointed out in the nc uh, reports is being implemented and put in place the corrective actions taken has been is being continued to be implemented with the audit follow up okay results of the audit program it may not have only one non conformity it may have a series of non conformity in various sections so all those reports it's all those are put together and it forms one audit report audit program monitoring and reviewing same thing what i said just now program monitoring will be what the results from the audit program 
if it need it it needs to be monitored and reviewed that is that's exactly what i said now that whatever is the findings we have to stick on to we have to implement it we have to correct it and put the corrective actions in place and for all, all these processes and any process in an organization we have to keep the records so the audit activity in clause 6 in page number 35 if you go to a flow diagram is given in your material in your uh, the, that is the overview of typical audit activities it is just explaining a typical audit activity to page number 35 if you have i am sure you will be having the material with you people who are having the hard copies with you can refer to the hard copy or others who are uh, having the soft copy please refer to the uh, flow diagram which is given in page number 35 page number 35 it starts with initiation initiating the audit how do you initiate the audit you have to appoint a team leader it's a team of say five people that has to be a one lead assessor who coordinates the complete work complete audit team he coordinates he communicates with the team and also um, uh, organizes um, what is it called compiles compiles the final report okay it has to uh, uh, the report has to be given a particular form that is given by the team leader and uh, defining audit objective scope and criteria determining the feasibility of the audit selecting the audit team establishing the initial contact with the audit team now audit um, has been initiated a team has been formed the scope is defined you have uh, formed the audit team now we communicate it to the audit team who is the audit team audit team will be the will be the organization the section which is going to be audited so all the individuals in that section in that particular section will be the audit team again among the audit team one will be representing the auditees and conducting document review is the first step that is now you have initiated the audit now what you are going to do you have to the uh, document uh, has to be reviewed what do we review review the uh, internal procedures the records their adequacy with the audit criteria now if you have a criteria for doing the audit there has to be a, a, a criteria basically what will be the audit criteria audit criteria will be the management system requirements which an organization has set up already there will be criteria defined there so according to that criteria the audit is being done by reviewing preparing for the on site audit activities it is done on site this document review can always be done off site also sometimes the auditor will ask for certain documents we have to send it across they do the desktop audit on that they do the review and then they come for an on site audit in the site the audit plan has to be prepared what work are they going to do assigning work to the audit team preparing the work documents what will be done in an on site audit then conducting on site audit activities conducting the opening meeting the communication during the audit the roles and responsibility of the guides and observers and then when the audit on site is happening it generates audit findings preparing the audit conclusion and conducting the closing meeting that 6.5 is basically what it's done on the site that is supposing if your organization is a food uh, uh, you know food processing industry the audit team what will do in your factory in the floor of the factory will be the on site audit activities then preparing approving and distributing what is preparing approving and distributing what audit report audit report is the outcome of the audit that is the product completing the audit completing the audit is the closing meeting 
conducting the audit follow up now if you see conducting the audit follow up is given in the dotted lines 6.8 clause number 6.8 why is it given in dotted lines because conducting the audit follow up can be done by an external auditor or it can be done internally by the organizations person involved because the audit is done audit report is prepared it is handed over to the organization there the job ends now how you have implemented the corrective actions what are the requirements what is to be done the deadline and whether it has been done in the deadline or not that is conduction of uh, follow up audit now in detail each of these process that is initiating the audit what we have done what is given in this flow diagram 35 is being given in detail okay first what was the first step in initiating the audit was appointing the audit team leader so when you are writing your uh, assignments also there is one question of on the auditing please do not copy exactly what is given in your material you read the material you understand and then then you write so that when you are writing you understand what you are writing not just copying them there will be small small mistakes in your material you when you just copy it down from the material on to your uh, assignment uh, booklet you are just making that mistake as such that is why you the marks are also being cut when we understand that it is just being copy paste from the material then it is obvious that we feel that you have not even read the standard ones okay so read the stand, uh, read the material understand what is given in the material and then you put it down in your own words now if you have a problem in putting down in your own words in the english language you can take the help of the material you can use the language but when the mistakes are given as such we understand that the person has not read the um, uh, material and they have not understand so when writing the um, assignments make sure that you first to read the material if you have to do any extra reading from the net that also you can do and then provide it in your own words rather than just copying what is given in the um, in the study material so initiating of the audit appointing of the audit team leader we have seen defining the objectives scope and criteria then you determine the feasibility of the audit what do you mean by feasibility of the audit whether adequate time and resources are available whether the organization will be able to provide all that all that comes in feasibility then an audit team is selected okay and then the actual conducting of the document review then after the document review the on site work begins that is the audit team is there in your premises doing the audit by doing the audit communication is being done done between whom between the auditors as well as the auditees auditor is the person who is doing the audit and auditee is the person who is on the receiving end is on the other side of the table like answering to what has been done the person who has done the work at whose work is being audited is the auditee now what is the roles and responsibilities of the guides and observers very nicely they have given what is the role of uh, the guides and observer observer is basically the auditor collecting and verifying information then these information whatever has been collected or whatever has been reviewed it is put in paper which is called the audit conclusion it can be a non conformity or it can be just an observations and then all these observation has whatever been observed during the audit process comes in the form of an audit report okay audit scope and then the audit report is uh, prepared and it is approved and it is handed over to the organization 
Now, while doing all this, it seems very simple. It seems it's very easy to become an auditor and do audit because we are going to find out somebody else's fault. No, when you are trying to, it is not a fault finding process. Audit is never a fault finding process. It is actually a process for improvement. You are find, finding gaps. You are just finding the gaps between the organization's management uh, structure, which has been set up and implemented. Comparing with the actual requirement, the criteria, which can be your own criteria or the criteria set by the standard. Now, the auditor should have basic qualities. What should be the qualities? We have already seen that uh, in the introduction. What should be the qualities? It is again has been listed in detail. What should be the qualities? Basically, ethical, should be open-minded, diplomatic, observe and he should be able to, he or she should be able to observe and understand. Versatile, this is a, should be able to take decisions and then knowledge and skills about the, about the activities which is being audited. If the person doesn't know anything about a food factory, how can that person do an auditing of a food factory? If a person has got no knowledge on testing, how can that person do it? Auditing of a testing laboratory. So it is very important to know the uh, uh, process which is going to be audited by that person. And then the audit evaluation. The evaluation of auditors and audit team also should be planned, implemented and recorded in accordance with the audit program procedures to provide an outcome that is objective, consistent, fair and reliable. Okay. So that's the end of the audit uh, unit two, which is regarding the audit, how an audit should be done and what should be the uh, qualities of an auditor. And again, at the end of this um, unit, there are suggested readings given where you can read 19,011, which is basically guidelines for system auditing. I hope uh, I'm clear. We'll go to the unit number three, which we have planned uh, to do today. And unit three is regarding standardization and accreditation. Here again, unit three, if you take in your study material, can you please open up everyone the unit three, which is regarding the unit three is regarding standardization and accreditation. I can quickly uh, glaze through this. Sridhar, I am in class. Can I call you back? Okay, uh, this accreditation and standardization. See, uh, rather than just reading or going through this uh, material, in one word first, uh, in one line, first I want to tell you what this act, standardization and accreditation means. Standardization, as the word says, it is to standardize something. Right? Standardize what? It can be standardization of a product. It can be standardization of a system. Since we are talking about systems, management system, quality management system, here, we are talking about here, the standardization is regarding the standardization of a system. Accreditation is what? Accreditation is when it is a, a system which is implemented, is certified or is, uh, you know, audited and uh, conformance is being checked and a formal accreditation is granted also with respect to the competence of the people who are working there and also uh, as a tool to confirm the conformity of an organization with a particular standard. So after uh, doing this, or this unit is regarding this standardization and uh, accreditation. Now this, why is this standardization um, so important? 
standardization is important because if every country or every why every country even within a country if every state or if every um, organization has their own way of making a product then it is very difficult to do a trade so basically it has come the standardization has come to bring a globalization that is to bring a harmonized harmony among the among the various organization that is why the standardization has come into picture so if we see that the minimization of trade barriers these trade barriers are because of the heterogeneity among the products and the policies which has been followed so to bring a harmonization among all a standardization is required and that is why these standards are being set up and one of the effective means of implementing the standards effective means for the benefits of standards to percolate through the society through a third party certification and accreditation system what is conformity assessment body conformity assessment body is a third party certification like it is an attestation when we submit the, uh, our uh, qualification certificate for any uh, organization for any work they will say that please get it attested what is attestation you take it to a gazetted officer you ask them to attest it what why is this attestation is done because that person says that okay i have seen the original the original and this copy is same and there is no uh, fake and there is no cooking up done in the certificates those bodies are called conformity assessment bodies and these bodies they grant the accreditation to the third party uh, to the organization international conformity assessment scenario there are bodies which are the international conformity assessment bodies which grants accreditation or to a conformity assessment body of various countries we will get and we'll look into these when we going through the unit like one is international accreditation forum this is a international accreditation forum is basically it has got some multilateral recognition arrangements uh, by uh, agreeing to certain norms and conditions these bodies are internationally placed which will do a conformity assessment okay and uh, the objective what is the objective of these bodies in all the countries of the world eliminating the need for suppliers or products or services to be certified in each country certified once accepted everywhere once in your country it has been tested and certified it will be accepted everywhere why because we are the part of this international conformity assessment we are accredited then our product will be accepted it is agreed it is uh, it is accepted it is it is a belief that when it is uh, an organization is being accredited or you know uh, is certified the product will meet a certain quality so we have a tendency or basically there is a understanding that okay a product which has got an isi marking on it means it is what does it mean basically it is an approval which is an informal approval is given to a consumer say uh, to understand that the product meets the quality every consumer cannot be uh, knowledgeable or they may not know that what are the requirements of a particular quality but when an isi marking is done on a product they understand oh isi mark is there which means that the product is good similarly that kind of um, acceptance is given worldwide when we become a member of this iaf so there are the various iaf programs are there which you can just read and understand it's uh, it, it is very uh, simple and uh, now this uh, when it comes to a laboratory as uh, your program also stress on the laboratory testing requirements and the the course which you are doing is also on food uh, testing and all that 
quality. So I am uh, straight away going to International Laboratory Aggregation Corporation, ILAC. This ILAC is basically, it was started as a conference in 1977, where ILAC, from the name itself, International Laboratory Accreditation Corporation, which means it has got bodies which are being accreditation bodies of laboratory. In India, the accreditation body of India is called NAB, National Accreditation Body for Testing and Calibration Laboratories. This NABL is the national body which is a member of this ILAC. ILAC not directly but through APLAC, which is Asia Pacific Laboratory Accreditation Conference. So through this, it is a body of ILAC, which means, what does it mean? If we as a laboratory in India or as an organization in India, if we are accredited by NABL, our certificates will be accepted worldwide because NABL is a member of ILAC also. So that's how ILAC plays uh, a, a role. And thus, through this ILAC, there are various regional corporations, which is called APLAC, Asia Pacific Laboratory Accreditation Conference. It is International Forum for the Development of Lab Accreditation Practices and Procedures, where the laboratory accreditation uh, is being promoted. ILAC Mutual Re Recognition Arrangement. There are, are uh, the, these are again technical barriers to trade, such as the retesting of products each time they enter a new economy will be reduced. When we try to sell a product which has been tested here, for example, any agricultural produce which is tested in a laboratory in India, it need not be tested again in another country because it is tested in an accredited laboratory, any buyer, any uh, importer outside the country, they can just look at the certificate and accept it because the laboratory is an accredited laboratory. So to reduce these kinds of barriers, these international forums have come forward and, and, uh, and giving formal recognition to the national accreditation boards. Now, the Quality Council of India, no, that was in the international level. Now, this is in the Quality Council of India at the national level. Quality Council of India is basically, it is an autonomous body by, by the government of India, which comes under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Now, what is the objective of QCI? Objective is to establish certain national accreditation boards. National accreditation boards for what all? For certifying quality management system, certifying environment management system, quality management personal training organization, as well as testing and calibration laboratories. So all these boards, which are formed in the national level, are coming under QCI. Various boards which are set up by QCI called Quality Council of India. The, what is the structure of QCI? QCI is a two-tier structure has been formulated. Is a top-level body responsible for formulating the strategy. Why is it two-level? The first level is, what does the first level do? The first level is responsible for formulating the strategy and policies. Okay, for um, monitoring of various components of QCI. What does the second level do? Because we said it is a two-tier uh, monitoring system. The second level bodies are the executive bodies, the board, the committees that implement the strategy. The strategy which is done by the first level executive committee is set up and the second level are the board's committees that will look into the implementation part. Each board has a chairman and a representative vol voluntary group of stakeholders. If you look into page 55, you can see the Quality Council of India. There is an organization chart like thing given. Please go to page 
55, not 55, sorry, 56. In your study material, page number 56. You can find a um, chart given by the Quality Council of India and under that, the various boards which are there. One is NABCB, that is the board for certification bodies, board for personal and training. Now this will be the most uh, common one which you would have heard, NABH. I hope all of you have got and all of you are seeing it. NABH is the National Accreditation Board for Hospitals and Healthcare which is the most important thing, especially for the last one year, everyone, each and every person, we are looking forward for the best hospital and healthcare. Due to this pandemic, we have realized how important it is and so many uh, lessons this pandemic has taught us and we understand that so many cases will be there, oh, this hospital is not taking care properly, there is some fraud, this is happening. All this is um, this is looked into by National Accreditation Board for hospitals because the hospitals, when they set up their management system, it is accreditation is governed by NABH. And then uh, NABL, NABL is Accreditation Board for Testing and Calibration Laboratories. So any testing and then it goes in detail it talks about only NABL because, as I said, our courses on food, quality management system, and where it also involves certain testing, that is why the testing laboratory board is only given in detail in your study material. In NABL, uh, it has got what uh, you can see, why do labs get accredited? As we said earlier, what is the importance of accreditation of a laboratory? Accreditation of a laboratory is important because supposing we have done a testing in India, a buyer which is sitting in UK or USA is trying to import, say, black pepper from India. Now, the buyer wants to know whether the testing of black pepper, he wants to know that, that the black pepper should be free of pesticides, or the black pepper should be of good quality with a certain content of volatile oil in it. So the buyer will tell the seller in India that I want the quality of the pepper which you are exporting having this, this, this quality. Now the seller of the India or the exporter has to approach to a testing laboratory, get his product tested and then forward the test report to the buyer who is sitting you know, seas across in USA or UK. Now, the buyer will ask whether the testing has been done from an accredited laboratory or not. That will be one of the criteria to believe on the test report. Why is this um, uh, question being asked, whether it is accredited or not? So that to understand whether the test report, the testing, uh, has been done properly according to the standard or not. So that is the importance of accreditation. It is to bring globalization and uh, to bring the uh, trade in, uh, in, you know, to bring, make the trade easier, this accreditation plays a lot of role. What is the benefit of accreditation? Because a formal recognition is given to a laboratory when a, a accreditation is granted, just it uh, to, first of all, it shows the quality with which a laboratory is working. Then what happens? It also increases the business. Why? Because the customer is, has got a lot of confidence in what the work they are doing. Customers can search and identify the laboratories from the NABL and their specific requirements. And then the users of the laboratories will enjoy the greater access for their products because in the domestic as well as international market, the uh, testing 
given by an accredited lab will definitely have more value than a testing report which is given from a non accredited laboratory scope of accreditation now what all in what all area is nabl giving accreditation nabl gives accreditation in testing various kinds of testing biological is there chemical is there electrical electronics all list is given now when it comes to food in this list only three are important one is biological second is chemical and then radiological now why radiological because uh, some of the like water and also some of the products they ask for the radioactivity also they want to see if it is contaminated especially because the water has ground water so whether it is contaminated with any nuclear uh, material and then the calibration laboratories the medical laboratories all those are there. now procedure for accreditation what is the procedure for accreditation procedure for accreditation is you have to again see what kind of iso system has to be implemented iso system is 17025 for the laboratory that is implemented and they have a set of guidelines where you have to do uh, you know the the standards should be there the your test equipment should meet the requirement it should be calibrated it should have uh, traceable reference standards should be available then you make the application to the nabl it will formally do a desktop uh, document review what we have seen in the auditing in the unit 2 we see how they how an auditing is done so nabl will review the documents will get back to the organizations saying that okay the document has been reviewed now i am going to set up an audit team an audit team is set up then the audit team leader will be appointed then the audit team comes to the uh, site they do an audit they submit the audit report and that is reviewed and finally the lab is the laboratory is accredited okay now after this um, um accreditation and uh, next in your study material given is iso 22003 food safety management system required requirement for bodies providing audit and certification of food safety management systems now 22003 they are not talking about 22000 22000 we are doing in your uh, study uh, it one of the units are regarding 22000 where we will be doing in detail about the 22000 here they have given about 22003 by 22003 what is 22003 doing three is actually providing audit and certification of food safety management systems okay so uh, uh, organization is having iso 22000 there this 22003 will provide information and criteria for carrying out the audit for iso 22000 so in brief iso 22000 is given here and clauses how it is uh, how it should be done but we are doing it in one of the units in detail in detail we have to do the 22000 so we can cover it in that unit iso guide 65 is general requirements for bodies operating product certification system that is the product certification system as i gave them example of a package drinking water similarly we can take the same example of package drinking water like it is a product it needs to be certified so what will be the requirements of the certifying bodies is covered under iso guide 35 and the certification system is given in detail then iso 17020 general criteria for operation of various types of bodies performing inspections a body which is performing an inspection what all has to be followed the various types of operations and the in detail what the requirements needs to be followed is given in 1720 in 17021 and 
conformity assessment requirements for bodies providing audit and certification management see you can see that various kinds of isos have been prepared and it is not similar iso 17020 is for bodies performing inspection 21 is for what providing audit and certification of management system okay and then it comes to 17025 2005 i would like to let you know that uh, iso 17025 2005 has been revised and now it is 2017 it is no more 2005 all the laboratories and everywhere in the world it has been asked to change over to 2017 version and now the labs are operating as per 2017 version and 2017 version also i am uh, sorry 2005 version also i am sure we are doing it one of the units in detail so we need to just have an introduction here only a small introduction is in here which is uh, basically 17025 is general principles of <laughs> competence of laboratory doing testing as well as uh, calibration including sampling sampling is also involved so this 17025 will be a set of uh requirements which are laid down for a laboratory or for a testing laboratory we will not uh talk about calibration laboratories here because we are also going to be involved in only testing as in your course it is food testing will be involved so we will talk about the testing now here in the 17025 also the complete management system it is not given in your uh, study material but i'm just telling you in brief that 17025 what it involves there is a general requirement which is called clause 4 general requirements will say that what how the organizations gen, general requirement which means it is applicable from the top ceo to the uh, watchman of the factory it is a general requirement which each and every member of the organization has to follow then comes the structural requirement of under clause 5 how the structure of the organization should be designed in order to do the testing of a product then goes to the uh, requirement 6 which is resource requirement resource requirement are the requirement of resources which should be made available and what are the requirements is listed in clause 6 Class 7 is a process requirement that is each process is given in detail of what is the like uh, sample receiving sampling reporting you know selection of test method uh, how you should handle the customer complaints how you should handle the non conformities what should be the you know and the um, uh, calculation part of the measurement uncertainties all these are given in clause number 7 clause number 8 is the management requirements now when it comes to management requirement means how you will be documenting we have already uh, seen the requirements in the uh, unit 1 isn't it how do you what do you do you have to have a document where you document your procedures and policies and then how you uh, document control it that is a particular giving a particular id to the document and then how to implement it your internal audit your management review is all given in clause number 8 with that we finish the unit 3 which is standardization and accreditation unit and that is what was planned for today's classes that is the unit 1 2 and 3 next day that is tomorrow we will be covering unit 4 5 6 and also we'll try to cover a portion of 7 7 is a big class a big unit so we'll try to cover the portion of 7 and my request will be that please keep your study material with you 
as I am going, as I am making this presentation or talking or whatever you or the lecture, whatever you uh, you can term it, you understand what I am uh, telling you. And uh, you know when you are going through the material, because I will be going as per the material which is provided by Igno. Thank you so much for uh, being there, and uh, I hope it has benefited. If you want to drop any message. You can drop it in the chat box. I'm telling, I'm telling this again and again because I don't see much, uh, in, uh, you know, communication in the chat box. If any improvement, uh, you know, to be done for tomorrow's classes or anything that you think that this has to be included, or the examples, or the language, or the speed in which the classes are being, I'm giving delivering my lecture. Any um, feedback you need to give. Please drop it in the uh, chat box. I can look into it and do accordingly tomorrow. Thank you so much.